welcome everybody and we'll be talking about procedural wall generation today I just added it to the project um, I haven't actually done it yet so we will find out if it works so uh, free for the next three days are um, um, epic uh, marketplace there is this here called procedural spline let's see free for the month. So you're going to need to download this or at least buy it for zero dollars. Come on. Anyone? No. Epic Games free for the month. Nope, not doing it. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. It's this one. So uh, go to the free for the month, buy all the free for the month things. You should do that every month anyway. It just will build up a nice collection of art assets and um, stuff, other stuff. And so for this one, it's called Procedural Spline wall system and I, I ran through about an hour of tutorials last night and I haven't actually done it yet so um, we'll see if we'll see if this uh, talk potatoes or not but uh, it looks pretty cool so uh, buy it and then add it to your project and then we will um, see if it works okay. so uh, there's a lot of procedural stuff and I'm, I've been kind of getting into getting into that side of things as well Okay, so, uh, let's see, wooden props, procedural walls, there it is. All right, so, um, blueprints. So if you want to add walls to your world, then um, uh, you can do it manually by, like, dragging out things like this and kind of scaling them around, but you notice that, like, when you scale something, it, like, stretches. So you have to make a master material for it and then individually you know put it make a material instance and then make a different material instance for each one of the different size walls you have and it's really kind of annoying to do and so this free for the month uh, in other words free for the next couple days uh, thing will do wall generation for you and it's pretty cool so let's find out if it works I'm gonna so I've added it to my project again you do that by purchasing it going in uh, from the marketplace go to free for the month purchase it then under your library system, you'll see this thing, procedural spline wall system, add to project, and then add it to uh, the project you're currently working on. And then once you do that, it will appear here under procedural walls, under blueprints, there is the BPU spline wall, and you just drag that out. Hopefully it crashes. It's thinking. It's thinking. My video is getting slow motion now. <laughs> one frame every three seconds got 20 cpu cores here pretty good video card compiling shaders that's a good sign there we go all right cool all right so it will make a wall and this is just a single wall segment right which is not especially interesting look at that low res quality oh. doesn't look good let's change this to like metal Metal. I don't know what theme I'm going for with this world here. Metal's kind of cool. Stones. Stone blocks. Eh, that's a little more in line with my ideas. So stone blocks. There we go. Okay. So. Uh, by default, it will make a single segment of a um, of a wall, and uh, let's see here. Spine. Frozen. issue with splines sometimes where it's just not letting me 
can't mess with them. Spline. Next. Walker's always mega chill and working on the mod right now. <laughs> Let's see. That works. You can see how it's um, automatically sliding the. See how the thing doesn't like distort the textures? It's quite nice. Why the quality is so low though. There we go. Okay, so um, you can do this. Let's see, how do I? S okay, there we go. Now I can select it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Like I've, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably doing something wrong, but like I've messed with splines before in the past, like when working on water, and sometimes it just really just doesn't want me to be able to click on those things. So if you um, Alt drag, it will create a new spline. And then you can just move the points around like this. And you can just sort of make an arbitrarily sized wall however you want. Um, if you scale it up. Oops, that's movement. If you scale it up. If you scale it up. Then uh, you can make some nice sized walls and all the things like the pillar heights and the, the wall caps and things like that. Those are all customizable. So let's see if I can get back to selecting you. Good. Excellent. So I'll just pull you over to here. And uh, if you want to make a new point, you hold down Alt and then click and it will make a new wall segment like that as well. And then I will finish it off by connecting it up like this. And you got yourself a cool little castle wall or whatever. Okay. All right. So that uh, kind of kind of a neat thing. Um, if you snap to the ground, it'll um, move the bottoms of the walls to be in contact with the landscape or other objects and things like that. It can cause um, issues. So uh, uh, you can make it rounded walls, or you can make it sharp walls. Um, always make walls level. We'll um, have them not come up at an angle like that. Instead, they'll just dig through the world. Um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, yeah, the age thing on that. That's pretty cool. Uh, so the pillar tops, you can, uh, you can make different shaped uh, pillars and stuff like that. Um, you can age them, which causes moss and things like that to appear as well. Um, And you can tint them, make them different colors. Um, yeah, most of that stuff is pretty obvious. Uh, the quality on this is just really poor. I don't know why it's not. I might, might be, I might be out of my texture budget or something. But um, thicker walls. Thin is like a tiny little wall. Um, all top variation. So, yeah, tons of fun stuff there. Make a little castle. I think that could be a fun assignment for you guys, right? Make a little castle or something. And then for, uh, individual segments of the wall, you can um, 
add like gateways and things like that into them. Uh, custom wall mesh. Arch. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. The whole thing is a giant barrel now. I do. Um, mm -hmm, doorway height, doorway width. Sections to add doorways. Uh, not you. This one? It's not very large. Uh, three, four, doorway height, two, doorway width, two. Three. So now, if we go in here, pretty cool. Uh, t -t 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 -t. Let's see if there's anything else that matters. I guess the aging is kind of cool. So um, you can age the walls to make them. I kind of want to just like reload this because this is really poor quality. Hmm. Hmm. So you can choose which points get pillars, by the way. So turn those on and off. Um, yeah, why is that so bad? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I have it set, I believe. I mean, it's not telling me I'm out of my texture budget. Uh, can, you, can you look at the command for me, Walker? I'll, I'll try that. Um, Um, okay, let me let me show you how you can like put moss and stuff like that on there. That's kind of fun. So there's a mode that we've never gone over before called mesh painting. And uh, so let's see here. So, um, you can, let's see here. you can paint, um, oh yeah, right. darker is more, except the quality is so bad you can't really see anything. Um, you can paint like moss and things like that onto the walls and you can, uh, age the walls as well. Um, so you can kind of, this is just spray painting you know, darkness onto it, but it's kind of hard to see with, um, the super low res texture quality, but you can, you can basically paint onto it, um, moss and like moss will grow on different sections and, um, yeah, over there it worked. Okay. Um, R string pool size, uh, R dot string dot pool size equals, yeah, there we go, all right, cool. All right, much better. <laughs> all right, uh, paint color.
it's not aging it. Let's see here. Use vertex painting, age and moss. Red controls the age. Green controls moss. Blue is darkening. Let's see here. Uh, age pillars. Uh, that's oh, these are the pillars. That's why not the walls. There. We go. Okay. So there we go. Nice. So you can see the areas where I uh, did the vertex painting. Uh, it's got a lot of moss growing on them. And then uh, let's see here, paint and. Um, you can age, you can add cracks and things like that to it as well. It's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. I like it. Uh, here. Paint. Spray paint moss into the cracks. It's pretty cool. And if you switch it over to the red channel, that will do aging. So you can age it. You can see cracks start appearing and stuff like that in it. It's pretty cool. And then you can darken it. As well, so you can you can use that to add some detail and character to your to your walls and stuff like that. Okay, so I think your assignment for Thursday will be to use this to build a castle. Does that seem fun? Does that seem like the kind of thing that you signed up to IS fifty B to do, or do you want to do something harder? And do the castle. Okay. And then you can you can add multiple layers to it, like maybe um, let's go back into select mode, and this is selecting the whole thing, right? So you can and no, notice how it snaps to the ground because I have snapping turned on. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that one's like sticking up. Um, yeah, now I can select the splines. Cool. Um, yeah, so again, uh, alt drag will add a new segment, and uh, delete will delete a segment out of it. There's no scaling issues. You see how these things slide around really nicely. Uh, the back here probably could use another point, so I'll click here and alt drag, and then pull that out here. And, uh, and then you can pull out a second blueprint like that and then have a second one inside of here. Oops. Let's see. Yeah, it's back to there we go. There. 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 Change it to stones. A little bit small, so let's move out the points a little bit. before. And then I'll just put a doorway in it and call it a day. So where is the doorway? Pillar top. Why not? Um, <laughs> pillar thickness five. There we go. Too big. Too. Age the pillars, sure. Add moss on the pillars, sure. Why not? All type. Age wall on. Add moss on. And then doorway. We're gonna add a doorway. And one, two, there we go. And the doorway 
will be there. Okay. Huh. Okay. Probably need to play with this a little bit. Landscape. Smooth, smooth that out a little bit. There you go. And then when I come back in here and move it, you'll see it snaps down properly. And then let's go back into landscape mode and go back into erosion. Erode this away a little bit. See how this works when we play it now. A little bit too steep here, so okay. Sculpt. Let's pull it up a little bit. Smooth. There we go. And preview. Yeah, okay. So I can put a treasure chest in here or something. Um, select mode. Wooden props. Meshes. be a secret inside of the castle. So we've got a cup inside of here and none of that's floating. I know that is floating. Okay. So you, I will move a little bit and you see it snaps down immediately when you move it, when you have snap turned on. So that yeah, looks pretty good. That part needs to snap too. That is Loading above the ground. Oh, it's because I didn't turn snap on. Uh, there. Okay. There we go. So I got a little castle, a little treasure chest on the inside. There. That's what you guys got to do for Thursday. It should be fun. Are you doing computational geometry this semester? I haven't been doing very much. Um, the students here aren't, uh, um, they haven't taken 45 yet and stuff like that. No, I guess Steph has. But, um, yeah, so I, I've been I've been going more on the uh, Unreal Engine side this semester than over uh, summer and, and spring. It just depends. I, 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 I tailor this course to the students in it. And, uh, you know, if I discover something new like this, cool little tool here. I'm just like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Moss pillars. Page pillars. Add wall. Page wall. There you go. You and Moya were into the re rendering pipeline also. Yeah. And partly it was because like you were asking like what does it mean to render things and rasterize things. I talked about it a little bit with them. Um, but not not super hardcore. Uh, uh, yeah. So there you go. Castle. Um, Alright, so yeah, let's let's talk maybe a little bit more about the the rendering pipeline. Why not? Um you're interested in the storing of data? Okay. So, um, the data, like how geometry data is stored, that kind of stuff. Like save files? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we talked about this already. Yeah. Um, and that. And that. Yeah, we've talked about a fair bit of stuff already. Um, Oh, 
that's that's CS twenty six. Um, player data, saving things. Typically, yeah. Okay, let's talk about some topics in advanced game development and stuff. Twenty eight, twenty one. So, uh, if you want to save your files, usually you make a serialize and deserialize function for all this stuff you want to write to this. Okay. So, if you've got um, a role playing game and uh, you want to um, write a player to disk, then the player will typically have a serialize function on him and it will say something like, uh, here's my name, here's my level, here's my strength and dex and con and int and wisdom and charisma. Uh, here's the indexes, indices of every item that I have. I've got a wand of fireballs with 20 charges. I've got a sword plus three. Um, basically what you do is you have each individual object in the world know how to save itself to disk and how to load itself off disk. And so you, the serialized function will dump a player or a monster or a map or whatever to disk. And then um, if the things that it's dumping is other things that are complicated, like a map might have more complicated things inside of it, then those things might have serialized functions. And so the map, to serialize the map, you serialize the map and then it calls the serialize on all of the objects inside of it, and all of that goes into a file or something like that. And that's the basic approach. And so each object knows how to write itself to disk and read itself back off disk is the general approach you want to take. Um, then you have some issues like uh, pre-caching and things like that. Like uh, you want to pre-cache all sounds textures, depending, <laughs> and meshes, because uh, if you have to load them while the game is running, the game will hitch. There'll be a, a noticeable jerk when um, the game loads the thing. So for example, if I were to come over here and hit this uh, thing, the game, pause. do you see that? Like the game pauses for a second, which is not good. Okay, it worked fine there. Uh, see, it, it, the game goes, and then it continues. And it's really, really annoying to players. Now, I, I, put, a, I put a lot of asterisks there because uh, Unreal Engine 5 is based on not needing to pre-cache so much, right? The, the notion of Unreal Engine 5 is that you can have a SSD that is fast enough that it can stream the textures and meshes and things like that in real time to you. So when you, you could load it at like a low res or you could pre-cache it at a low res, then as you walk closer to it, the disk will be able to supply the additional texture data and object uh, geometry data as you walk up to it, and then when you walk away from it, it can unload it from memory dynamically. And so uh, some of the stuff is like um, based on old hard drive spinny disk thinking, because when you load a level, you sit there and you load all your stuff into RAM, because RAM's fast. But SSDs are pretty fast also, right? And so the, the new thing which isn't even out yet, it's how new it is, is that you can simply um, walk up to things and have them load dynamically as you're coming closer to them. So we'll see how that works out in practice. Should be cool. Like, I don't see why it shouldn't work. But we'll see how it goes. I have not tried it Unreal Engine 5 yet. So, um, UE4 has enough bugs as, <laughs> as it is. <laughs> uh, you know. Okay. So, yeah, that's basically that. Um, you, you want to be a little bit smart about it. Um, um, you can just save a difference. 
from the original map and the changes you made. So if the map's really big and complicated, you don't necessarily need to save all 100 megabytes to disk, right? What you can do is have the original map and then write any changes to it, right? So think about Skyrim, right? The map in Skyrim or Morrowind is gargantuan. Um, if you pick up a key, the map's changed, right? And so now you have to save the whole thing to disk? No. All you need to do is say, the key's not on the map anymore. So object 7842 is no longer on the map. You just write that to the file. It's in my character inventory. And so if you're clever with things like that, you can minimize the amount of writing to disk you have to do. You don't have to rewrite the map file. Instead, you can just write the changes the player's made. And sometimes though that causes problems because the players will just go around and start making a lot of changes. Like in uh, Valheim, people have completely terraformed entire regions of Valheim. And the, the game, the way it was made, it actually just, it recorded all the changes like I was talking about, right? And so it, it would write down, they lowered the map elevation by one. They lowered the map elevation by one. They lowered the map elevation by one on this square and on this square and on this square over and over again. And so you'd walk up and it would have to reapply all of the digs that people have ever done on that segment of the map. And it could be a lot, you know, because things like the leveling tool in Valheim doesn't work very well. And so people would sit there leveling it over and over and over again. And so what happened is you'd walk into an area and start lagging because it was like rerunning through, you know, a year's worth of history uh, adjustments to the train and stuff like that. So, um, so they added an optimization that flattened all of the uh, changes together. So rather than needing to save two decreases in elevation and two increases in elevation, it would just be like there was no change in elevation. So uh, that was a that was a good optimization they made to that. If if I'm understanding the patch notes right, obviously I don't have any particular um, insight into the company or how they do things, but just from reading the patch notes, that's what I imagined was happening. And if it's not what happened, um, it's still a good lesson for you guys. So yeah, saving changes is good. Um, but, uh, if you do like, um, a lot of changes, then that can get just as bad. Um, path of, what is it called? Pillars of eternity. Pillars of eternity would save every change your players made every time you quick saved to the world, as far as I can tell. So when you're starting the game, it's real fast. By the time you, you got to the end of the game, every time you hit quick save, it would save everything you've ever done in the world ever to the save file. And that got slow. And the game would quick save every time you walked into a shop, every time you walked out of a shop, it would auto save. And so I stopped wanting to go into a shop because there was a zone. You'd have to zone in, talk to the shopkeeper, buy a torch or whatever, and walk out. And I was just like, you know what? I am just not going to buy a torch because it takes 30 seconds to walk in a damn door. And then I, I'm just buying, I, I just, I, I don't need the torch. It's fine. You know, because then I walk out, it's another 30 seconds. And it just got longer and longer and longer and longer as the game went on. And um, I actually stopped playing. Uh, Pillars of Eternity because the save system was so bad. It would save literally everything you've done ever to one file. And the better way of doing it, of course, is to say on this map, these changes were made. On this map, these changes were made, right? Um, but I mean, if you want a save file to be, you know, contain, you know, the whole save, I, I, get, I don't know, you know, there's they fixed it eventually and I started playing again and finally beat Pillars of Eternity and Pillars of Eternity 2, which are both fantastic role playing games. Um, but yeah, if you don't do your save system right, you know, it makes a game, makes a game unplayable. So Walker, you have a comment on that? I saw there's just a blank, uh, feels lag, man. That's funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, any other questions about how things are done in games? Um, any of you think about working in the games industry? Walker, you still you still want to work in, in games?
It would be it would be fun, yeah. And so just uh, developing your skills. Pick one area that you like. Like if you like world building, then you know just like really like get into it. Um, I'm I've I've been sort of pushing my daughter towards it, and I think she's uh, like, no, I don't want to do this for my living. I just want to do it for fun. Like, all right, all right, fine. I've got hired at Bungio. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the whole materials thing, like there are people who just make materials, you know, that's, that's a thing you can do. Um, you guys have all done lurping on the materials and making new materials by lurping together other things and dynamic materials. And, um, we haven't tied together materials and blueprints. That could be fun. What, um, want to work on destiny too? Man, I guess, <laughs> uh, what, what particular thing do you guys want to do? Like game design, map design, materials, sound, AI, you know, game code, like what, what specific things interest you? Cause it's a, it's a giant field. And, and one of the problems I have in teaching this class is that there's just so much damn stuff, you know, like. We've done dynamic materials, but we haven't tied them to blueprints, right? Where you make it so, like, you pull a lever and, like, a, a wall ages in front of you. You can do that. You know, it's kind of cool, too. I've done it two or three years ago, but I haven't done it recently. Um, what's game design? Uh, game design is um, people get paid to design games. And, you know, they're not coding, necessarily, although... Ultimately, you know, everybody pitches in probably a little bit, depending on the company. Um, but like a, a friend of mine, he worked for um, Wizards of the Coast, uh, Pokemon, Nintendo. And uh, he is a game designer. He's not a programmer. He's a game designer. He's a really smart dude. And he knows all about how to make games fun and interesting and stuff like that. And he gave a talk here last summer. And so if you check on the modules section on Canvas, uh, you can see there's a, a lecture tagged as guest lecture. Click on that and you can watch the interview with him that he gave. Designing infrastructure? No, like actually designing the game. Like, uh, in, you know, how does an ult work in Overwatch? You know, or the notion that there's ults at all. Somebody had to come up with the notion for Overwatch, right? We're gonna take a first person shooter, Team Fortress, <coughs> And, excuse me, and did I say Team Fortress out loud? We weren't supposed to say that out loud. We're going to take Team Fortress, and we're going to make it colorful, you know, and we're going to make it shiny, blizzard polish, and then we're going to take the ability system from a MOBA, having three, you know, primary abilities or whatever, or some are passives, whatever, and a Q for ult, you know? And that's, that's our over... Somebody had to come up with that design, and that person's a game designer. Right? They don't have to code. They just have to know and love games and things like that. And for a lot of you, you're thinking, wow, that's probably an ideal uh, you know, uh, job. Yeah, it's, it's the ideal job for a lot of people. <laughs> right? And so it's, it's, a, it's a hard, it's a hard uh, thing to get into. Um, but uh, it's, it's dual. You can do it. Um, what design patterns? Uh, no, design patterns are, are completely different. They're, uh, those are things in... Yeah, I don't want to say C++. In and, and programming languages where, like, you architect the code. That's, like, if you're going to make a server that handles 20 people at a time, you can do, like, a standard multi-threaded, you know, setup. But if you're going to be handling thousands of clients at a time, 10,000, 100,000 at a time, then you need to use maybe the reactor code pattern in it. And a code pattern is a way of going about architecting your code in a time-tested and proven method. You know, and people will talk about these code patterns like um, the the um, singleton or whatever. You know, so everybody kind of knows what you're talking about. Like, I'm going to use a singleton here. Are you sure? Singletons are kind of butt, dude. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is appropriate for a singleton. Okay, well, I mean, if you're sure, you know. And that's different from game design. In game design, you, you study the the archetypes, like the, the fundamental uh, components of games. Theory of Fun, Raph Koster, that book that I've talked about in the past. Um, textbooks like this, Designing Games and Simulations, right? Um, this isn't programming. It's not 
um, you know, anything technical. But it's like, all right, uh, how do you represent reality in a game? You know, what is the appropriate level of abstraction? What time frame should you be talking about? Should there be a linear, radial, or interactive structure to the game? Uh, what type of interaction is should be taking place between players? Um, and so here it's a industry and social services minister role description. Uh, I have no idea what this is. Uh, what is this? It's like a simulation, like labor force or something. I don't know. It's a board game. It's not, or it's a, a classroom simulation. But the principles apply to video games too. And so talking about like genre and um, things like game mechanics, there's the encyclopedia of game mechanics I've talked about in the past. Gaming engine architecture is also different. So if you want to be a game engine developer, that's also a different thing. And that's what we focus on a lot when uh, Walker took it. We've done less this semester. Um, let's try this yeah, uh, game mechanics. Game ontology. It's like all the all the important characteristics of a game. So if you get into game design, ah, can't be found. Great. Uh, here we go. Uh, no, no, that's not interesting. Um, yeah, there's a whole language that people use when they're designing games and things like that. Um, uh, the different components that come together in making games. Yeah, partly. Um, Let's see if I can find it on Amazon, maybe. Um, this one, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. So this is the building blocks of table, tabletop game design. And so what kinds of mechanics go into making a game? Things like drafting. So the drafting mechanism is you have a bunch of cards, you pick one, you pass the rest to the left. And so you get other people's hands and you take it and pass on to the left. So that's a mechanic. Or um, uh, you roll a bunch of dice, you select some of the dice and re-roll the others. That's a mechanic. And there are a lot of mechanics like that in just board games. And they apply to video games as well. And this is like part of the lexicon, the, the language you need to know in order to be a game developer. A game designer, I should say. You can most certainly be a game developer without knowing this stuff. Uh, trader games, single loser games, cooperative, semi-cooperative. These are the types of games there are. Is it cooperative? Is it competitive? If this sounds like the game analysis I've had you guys do, it, yeah, same thing. Uh, do people play at the same time? Do they take turns? You know, uh, is it real time? Um, uh, Captain Sonar is a real time submarine game, 4v4 board game. It takes place in real time with uh, two submarines hunting each other. It's pretty cool. Um, actions. What kind of action Action points? Like in um, Divinity Original Sin, every time you go, you have a certain number of action points that you use to move and cast spells and things like that. Um, uh, how do you resolve winning? Roll two dice, get the highest number. Um, check to see if, uh, you, like in D&D... &D, um, 2.0, if you had a, a dexterity of 15 and you made a stat check, you'd roll a d20. If you got below 15, you succeeded. Um, RPS, uh, voting, player judging, like these are all the core concepts that go into making games. And they all apply in video games as well. You know, do people go at the same time? Do they take turns? Like how, how, how do you win? Like a check, like when two people are competing, who wins? You know, um, how do you, how, how does victory work, right? Uh, betting, bluffing, uncertainty, how much do you know about what's going on in the game? How, how does the player economy work? 
auctions are a huge thing in a lot of games. Like I played Power Grid the other day. It was a board game. And the core mechanic in, in Power Grid is that new power plants come up for auction every turn and the players bid on them. And obviously there's some that are better than others, but people will start bidding higher on them. So maybe you pass and, you know, let you know, other people get that one. So you get a different one. Maybe it's not as good, but for a lot cheaper. Uh, worker placement games are huge in board games. Uh, Lords of Waterdeep, all these kinds of things. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico, you place workers on the, the map to do different things. And a lot of times Agricola, you can, if you put a worker on a spot, then other people can't. Like there's all of these things. And this is a giant book, by the way. And um, yeah, a game is a language. And so when you're talking game design, you speak this custom domain specific language with the other people. So, uh, if you're into game design, like check that out, um, or put it on your, it's expensive. So put it on your wish list for Christmas or something. I don't know. All right. Um, yeah. And, and then architecting a game from a code perspective, that's a whole different thing too. So how do you design a game from a code perspective is different from how you design a game from a game design perspective, game, pres game design perspective is like, okay. We're going to have five cards and you're going to select two of them and play them. The other three get discarded and then both players reveal them at the same time and then they resolve. That's game design. The person who actually has to make that work is the game programmer, right? And so the game programmer wants to know, is this single player? Is it multiplayer? Like, how multiplayer is it? Are you going to have a million people on the server playing Magic at the same time? Because that's going to be different from if it's just 1v1 Magic the Gathering or something like that. So, um, I feel like a lot of people think being a game designer is just thinking of ideas and getting paid for it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a hard, um, it's a hard career, you know, like you, you gotta test and refine and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the board game industry obviously has a lot of game designers in it. Like you'll see Reezer Kinesa or whatever the guy's name is. Uh, what was his name? Reiner Kinesia. Kinesia. Yeah. Designer of over 700 published games. He designs the games. He doesn't cut out the boards and things like that. He designs them. You know, so. Um, he's board game designer two. <laughs> Who's one? Maybe that's a section or something. Oh, there's number one. Okay. Oh, he founded Helms and Blue. Okay. All right. All right. Interesting. Um, so. not play that game. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so game design, is, it's a whole industry, it's a whole field that you can get into. Map making is a whole thing, you know, art is a whole thing, so. Um, Reiner, yeah. Um, Singletons, yeah. Um, let's see what else you guys talked about here. Coding, game development. AI was fun. We're doing the game jam. Uh, neat thing Minecraft did with saving was instead of saving the world, you just save a world seed, which contains how to generate the world. Yeah, you don't have to actually dump all the all the data to disk. It's true. But you have, to, you have to write the changes you make to it. I like to work in Destiny 2. Would be fun to work in the games industry. Yeah, the, the main thing is, like, for me... Um, is, is my, my recommendation to use to find, yeah, Walker just posted a huge list of different jobs in the game field. Just find something that, that appeals to you, that interests you. I've been trying to give kind of like a high level, you know, overview of like all these different things. Just find something and then you have to like get into it. Like you have to like, like get into it, you know, and be good at it. You know, uh, it, it's important to know the other things as well. Just so you have kind of a conversant knowledge of like what goes into programming and what goes into art and what goes, you know, you kind of have to be aware of that, but you have to be good at one thing because that's what they're going to be hiring you for, you know, unless it's like a really small game studio and they're having, having you do everything. Um, in general, you're going to be focused on just, you know, producing maps or whatever. So 
uh, tools engineer is another is another job where you're not even making a game. You're making the tools that allow people to make games. So, for example, maybe you make a tool so that the art person, after they produce a mesh, uh, they open up your tool and it like puts it into a database or it moves it over to a network file share and puts it in the right directory and uploads the metadata to a website, an internal intranet website so that people can search it and be like, all right, I need a door or whatever. And it's like, oh, there's five doors available. And then it tells you where in the file share to find it. There's, you know, um, <laughs> probably somebody has to wrangle Perforce and get Perforce running. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, AI, uh, yeah, yeah. AI is, uh, is a whole thing too. Uh, user interface, yeah, somebody needs to make all the uh, the user interface stuff for a game, you know, that's a whole, it's a whole thing. Um, uh, the release engineer, that's, yeah. Um, somebody has to handle it. Sometimes it's not a separate job, right? Just like, um, at id software, Romero was the release engineer just because, uh, he knew how to package it up. He had done it enough times. And so, you know, he was in the office at like four, four o'clock in the morning, burning a CD that had everything on it, you know, and then mailed it off to be manufactured you know, and stuff like that. Network programming, yeah, it's huge. Uh, networking is really, really important. Um, most online network code I find to be horrible. Um, per force, yeah. Um, like, it, like the way, like, Pokemon Go made, I don't know, like $9 trillion or something, right? But, um, the networking code in, in Pokemon Go, at least when it launched, was really, really bad. Like, you couldn't even play the game. It was a mobile game. You couldn't even play it if you had, like, one or two bars of coverage. Because every time you went up to a Pokestop, uh, it would it would try loading a high-res image that would appear just on that little dial that you spin. And it wouldn't let you spin it until the image was loaded. And so you click on it, and you're, you're hitting the, the thing, and it's like, nope, nope, nope. You have to look at the image. You have to look at, you have to look at the image. And if you close it and open it up again, it would unload the image and then reload again. You're like, oh, you know, just please just pre-cache the data if you're going to do that. Or, you know, just let me, um, just let me spin it without looking at the picture because I'm in front of it. I can see it. It's right there. You don't need to have a picture for me. So, uh, I haven't, I, I've only seen one episode of Black Mirror and that was one about a prime minister and a pig. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to pass on that one. So, um, uh, what makes a network programmer good? Uh, being able to have your game run with minimal latency and minimal glitches, like people not rubber banding around, uh, not being out of sync, things like that. And you'd be surprised, like, how bad networking is. Maybe you're not surprised. I don't know. But, like, Civilization, which is a turn-based strategy game, right? There's absolutely no excuse for civilization games to get out of sync, but they do, and they do all the time. And generation Civ four, Civ five, Civ six, they just get out of sync. And it's like, why? How? You know, a person moves a spearman two squares to the right. One person sees it, the other people don't. How is that possible? You know, like it's just a yeah, total war. Yeah, same thing. It's like how? Like it's a turn-based game. It's a turn-based game. You don't, like, it's not even real time. Like, you don't, it's not like Quake where all these things are happening, you know, and there's explosions, and if you're off by one frame, then the person gets hit or not hit, and the player prediction gets messed up. It's, you're, like, move the horse guy three squares right. Like, it's, it's the simplest networking in the world, or it should be, and somehow it just constantly, like, the last time I tried playing Civ online, like, we just gave up, because every... Every 10 minutes is a desync. And then everybody has to quit and rejoin the server. And then it has to re-download the save file to everybody, which takes forever. And I don't know why any of that is the case. Like, it's just terrible. Or if you look at Call of Duty and things like that, how their network stacks work, they're so, so bad. They're just so bad. And so if you want to, like, get into, like, networking, that's, like, a career for you. You can be a network programmer. And... Not a lot of people are good at it. So that's, you could just like get a job for the rest of your life doing network programming, you know? So, um, 
Yeah. So just uh, yeah, just write write to me on chat right now. We we got to wrap wrap this up. It's it's already over time. Just post for me on chat like what jobs you'd be interested in doing if you were to work in the games industry. Obviously, I'm not pressuring you into it or anything, but just tell me which uh, which jobs you'd like to have. Each of you put one one uh, title on there, and then I'll try to customize uh, this class to you. For now, just make a castle for for Thursday. Okay. The uh, the tool um, it's pretty easy to use, but you need to do it before you know October, this is, or at least, at least you're gonna have to buy it before October. Otherwise, the homework <laughs> homework's gonna get a lot more expensive because you know, I think it's like a twenty dollar uh, tool or something normally. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone, uh, and uh, yeah, just everybody post what what you like to do, what you would like to do, what you're most interested in on the chat channel, and then I will, like I said, tailor this class to you. All right. So I'll see you all on Thursday, and have fun storming the castle. No, have fun making the castle. <laughs> see y'all.